The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The words of Jesus. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city upon a hill cannot be hid. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of these least commandments and teaches others to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father, so open our hearts and our minds that we can be truly attentive to your word, that we can hear it, and it can take deep root in us and grow to maturity through all that we say and do. Help us day by day to become more like your son, living in his death and resurrection and being a witness to the world. Help us to do this, for it is something by ourselves we could not accomplish. Now gather us around your word, help us to hear it, and in hearing it, help us to live. We ask and pray all these things in your name. Amen. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, heaven and earth will pass away, but not an iota or a dot of the law will pass from till it is accomplished. Who then relaxes the least of these commandments shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but he who does them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in truth. Your word is truth. Amen. I was at a wedding reception a number of years ago now, many years ago, longer ago than I care to remember, when a young man who had grown up Lutheran, had been taught the catechism and been faithful in Sunday school, but as he had gotten older, had gotten involved in one of the local fundamentalist gospel churches, came up to me and said, you Lutherans don't preach the gospel, do you? And I said, really? Surprise to me. And he says, well, I know you guys get your sermons mailed to you every week from headquarters in Minneapolis. And I thought, oh, I wish that was true. That'd be a lot simpler. I start working on next Sunday's sermon on Sunday afternoon of the sermon I've just preached. Look up the text, put them down on a piece of paper so I can begin to make notes. And every Tuesday I meet together with other pastors in the area for our pastor's text study where we spend the morning going over the text for the coming Sunday. We talk about them, we argue about them, we share our insights, we look at the Greek and the Hebrew, we talk about old sermons we preached and come up with ideas that we hope nobody else has heard before so that we can begin to prepare for preaching the coming Sunday. And, of course, every pastor has his own routine following that. Some pastors write their sermon that afternoon. I don't usually write or think about my sermon in any really heavy details and start putting things on paper until Saturday because I find most times that I have to let it percolate for a few days and then there are always events that come up that need to be added into the sermon. But if you want to get a real good fight going at a pastor's text study, all you need to do is ask Tell us about the three uses of the law. And when we talk about the law as Lutherans, we're talking about the commandments from Scripture. 
We're not talking about the laws of the state and the federal government. We're talking about God's law in Scripture. And Lutherans recognize that our, there are two, maybe three uses of the law, and that's where the fight begins. The first use is easy. The first use is to keep social order so that things don't fall apart. What would it be like if the governor comes on in a press conference today and says, tomorrow in the state of Iowa, there will be no laws? I'd move to Wisconsin today because I wouldn't want to be in a place where there are no laws. And so the first use of God's law is to keep people in order. And it doesn't matter whether they're believers or not, it's there to, to restrain human evil and wickedness. And most Western governments, most Western legal systems, in one way or another, are based on the Judeo-Christian understanding of the law. The second use of the law is a much more critical one. And it's kind of like what most of us do every morning when we get up. You stumble into the bathroom and and whatever morning routine you have, but at some point in time, you've got to look at the mirror. And I don't know about you, but my mirror doesn't lie to me. It shows me exactly what's there. And some mornings, it's pretty scary. I'd like to think that there, that 45-year-old man is there and all bright and cheery hair isn't gray anymore, but that just ain't the truth. And the mirror's not going to let me get away with that. That's the second use of the law. The law is a mirror to show us what God sees. The law is there to point out our sin. Or as my Langton used to say, the law accuses us. And if you ever run across anybody who says, oh, I don't have a problem with sin, what you need to do is sit them down and start with the commandments. Commandment number one. I am the Lord your God, you shall know their gods before me. And Luther says we are to fear and love God above everything else. And what I teach the confirmands is that what Luther means in saying that is that every minute of every day of the entirety of your life is to be about God. How are we doing? I don't usually get out of bed without ruining that commandment, and the rest of them isn't much better. The commandments always point out to me my sinful nature. And that's part of their purpose. The intent of the commandments is to help me see that I can't conquer sin in my life. I can't defeat it. I can't remove it from my existence. I can try. I can strive to do that. I can work hard to do that. But the truth of the matter is it's always going to be there. And Luther was quite right when he said that Christians are at the same time forgiven and a sinner, a saint and a sinner, justified and a sinner. And as long as I inhabit this flesh, this body, I'm going to have to deal with sin. And the law won't let me ignore that. And that's a good use of the law because it makes me despair of my own righteousness and then ask myself, if I cannot fulfill God's commands, if I cannot do that which God asks, how can I be saved? And as St. Paul writes, and as Luke writes, with human beings, it's impossible. But thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whose death and resurrection you and I have been baptized, whose death and resurrection has covered our sins and given us the gift of forgiveness. And where there is forgiveness, there is life and salvation. And so the law does its work in convincing us that we can't save ourselves and that we need a savior. And it teaches us, I hope, to trust in the promises of God in Jesus Christ that in the dying and the rising of Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Now that doesn't mean that the law is now out of our lives because what Jesus says in the gospel lesson today is still true. The law hasn't gone away and if you teach anybody to slack off on it in any way, you're the least in the kingdom of heaven. And that's where the Lutherans talk about the third use of the law. And that's where you can get a real fight going. The third use of the law is often described as 
the way in which we live. It is a guidepost, a guide for us to live our lives. And that sounds really good on the surface. Except you get 10 Lutherans together and you ask them how the commandments would have you live your life and you get 11 different opinions on what that means. And some of it's downright unhealthy. This is a German congregation. And as a German congregation, you wouldn't even think twice about offering your pastor a beer. You would just simply would, that's just normal. And you'd have beer at a reception for a wedding and you'd dance and have a good time. I grew up among Lutherans who had come from Norway and were Haugi Pietists. If you've never run across a Haugi Pietist church, you're in for a treat. Take the most conservative, narrow-minded Baptist you can think of and double it. And that's a Haugi Pietist. I was told in Sunday school that good Christian boys and girls don't smoke. Well, that makes good sense. They don't drink. Well, as a teenager, that makes good sense. They don't go to dances. They don't go to movies. They don't read certain kinds of books. And on and on it went. Because they believed that the law says these things are bad and you shouldn't do them. And so they decided almost everything that even remotely looked like fun was against God's law. There's a story of the Lutheran pastor who was captured by the Japanese at the beginning of World War II and was walking around in the concentration camp where all the other missionaries who had been captured had been placed and a group of Baptist pastors came up to him and said, you pastor so-and-so, we know that you're saved and redeemed. Not like all those other Lutheran pastors. And he said, oh, really? How do you know that? Well, you don't smoke. And he goes, really? They were like my hoggy pietist forebears in that they judged a person on the outward externals. And the pastor that day went and found a pack of cigarettes from one of his friends and spent the rest of the afternoon walking around the camp smoking cigarettes. Because the moment we start telling or deciding how people are to live according to our interpretation of the law, we go sideways. Yes, the law is good, and yes, it's there for us to lead our lives, but they are lives to be lived and lived in Christ and in his love and mercy and grace. And the moment I start telling someone that a practice that is important to me and I think is essential is essential for them, and if it doesn't depend on salvation, then I become a Pharisee, a legalist. I've turned the law from a gift into a burden. And that's not what Jesus intended at all when he said that the law is fulfilled. The law is fulfilled in his dying and rising. And in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have been set free from the law that condemns and accuses us so that we can live our lives in Christ. Jesus starts this gospel lesson by telling us we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's kind of a big burden when you think about it. We're to light up the world. What are we to light up the world with? The law? No, we're to light up the world with the gospel of Christ. The gospel that has stepped down to earth, become human, took on human flesh, suffered and died on the cross and was raised on the third day. As St. John says, this is a light that has come into the world and the world doesn't understand it and can't overcome it. We are to become that light and we can't become that light by ourselves. I can't become the light of the world by keeping the law. I can't become the light of the world by being more righteous than my neighbor. I can only be the light of Christ in the death and the resurrection of Jesus into which I've been baptized. And then I struggle to live out that baptism day by day which is what the law and the gospel has always been about. The law reminds me how much I need a Savior. And that's not just for Sunday. The law reminds me of how much I need a Savior each and every day. That all I have to do is look at my life and understand that my life is not fulfilling everything that God desires for me. But thanks be to God through the death and resurrection of Jesus into which I have been baptized, there is grace and mercy and forgiveness for even me. And that's where we become the light of the world. 
We become the light of the world as we go out into the world and we let people, people know that Jesus Christ, through his dying and rising, has forgiven me my sins and claimed me as his own and opened the gates of heaven for me. And that gives people the opportunity to say, if God can forgive that person, there's hope for me. If Jesus Christ can be merciful to Gary Hatcher, he can be merciful to me. There is hope. And I become the light of the world through my baptism into Christ, through my life in Christ, through the fulfillment of everything that God has commanded in Christ. And I strive to live more and more in him each and every day, understanding that I'm never going to get done perfectly, I'm never going to get it done right, but each and every day is another opportunity to live and serve for the Savior. As Jesus says, to take up our cross and follow him. To put to death the old Adam so that the new Adam can come and live in me and serve the Lord and Savior. So let the law be what it is. A restraint on evil. A reminder of how much we need a Savior because of our sin. And then the opportunity for us to fulfill our baptism, to live in Christ however he has called us to live, so that we can become the shining light, the salt of the earth that God intends us to be, because that is the purpose of the church. Letting the world know that there is still hope, that there is salvation, and that sinners can be saved. And there is no one so wretched, so alienated from God that they cannot be redeemed and become a new creation. We are the light of the world, folks. A light reflecting the glory of God in Jesus Christ given to us in our baptisms. We forgiven sinners. We lawbreakers. We redeemed. We are the light of the world. Let your light shine. Amen.